Well, I know it's like a holiday weekend, but I want you to get loud today. Can you do that? I want you to like respond because we have three amazing individuals, not just, there's not speaking, it's not just going to be one person, it's going to be three people today. And I've asked each of these individuals to share. We're talking today about living boldly for God at different ages and stages of life. You look over here and you see people of different ages and stages. On the end there is my, my oldest, who's in his 20s. Next to him is Stephen, who's in his 40s. You're same age as me. I think you're like 10 days younger or something like that, pretty close. And then we have my mom. I'll let her tell you her age. <laughs> it, it, we're going to be talking about living boldly at different ages and stages. Now... The examples might be different because it's different what it looks like when you're 20 and you're in your 90s, Carlton. It, it, it looks different, but the principles are the same. So no matter who's sharing, I want to encourage you, take notes, lean in, shout them down as we talk today about living boldly for God. First up is my oldest. Would you welcome Ian Jude Reeve? <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Well, how cool is this? It's not just a normal Sunday. We get to hear from three different generations. I am super, super excited. And I thought I'd start off by just sharing a little bit of a story. So for those of you that don't know, I've been around 24 years, and I haven't always been this cool. I was, <laughs> I was a weird kid growing up, I'll be honest with you. I recognize it. See, most two- or three-year-olds, they like to watch cartoons in the morning. They'll sit in their high chair and eat some breakfast and watch cartoons. That wasn't me. I was glued to the golf channel. And not just golf tournaments. I'm talking instructional videos. I was there taking notes, trying to figure out my golf game at two years old. So I wasn't normal. I was also one of those kids that really wanted to just grow up. I wanted to be an adult. I thought it seemed so exciting and fun to get to that stage in life, and really one of the main reasons was I wanted to make decisions. I wanted to be able to make my own choices. Because as a kid, really, particularly when you're really young, you don't get to make a whole lot of the decisions for yourself. A lot of the decisions are made for you, and rightfully so, because if it were up to seven, eight-year-old Ian, I'd be going to Disneyland instead of school, I'd be eating candy for breakfast. I wouldn't be making the right decisions. And so I can remember as a kid, my dad would take me to the movie theaters, and it was always so exciting. It was fun. We'd go, just the two of us, if we were on a baseball trip to Arizona or something like that, we'd take some time and go to the movies, and I loved it. I'm not a huge movie buff like my grandpa is, but I still enjoyed it. However, there was one thing I didn't like, more than didn't like, I hated this. I wasn't allowed to get any candy at the movie theater. <laughs> Never. Not once. And it wasn't because we were trying to be healthy. It wasn't because we were trying to eat right. We were on a diet. It was because it's too expensive. <laughs> it cost too much. I would, I would beg, Dad, please, please, just one bag of candy. Just one. Are you crazy? Don't you know how expensive the movie theater candy is? And so I remember, after countless times of being told no, I vowed, when I grow up and I can make my own choices... I am not going to be like that. I'm going to go to the movies and get all the candy that I want. And so sure enough, about a week or two ago, I took my fiance Julia to the movies, and we saw The Fall Guy. And this was a nice theater. Okay, This was one of those that it reclined all the way back. It had a concession stand, but not just that. It had a menu on the seat. You could order ahi tuna, sushi, whatever you want to, the, to, the, uh, to your seat. I don't know who's ordering ahi at a movie theater, but... You can. And so we sit down, and I, I kind of, out of the corner of my eye, glance her looking over the menu, trying to see what she wants, and then she looks at me, and she kind of bats her eyes. Do you think we can get some candy? <laughs> and flashbacks. I remember all the times my dad said, no, no, no. And I vowed I'm not going to be like that. When I grow up, I'm going to make my own choices. So I looked at her, and then I looked over the menu, and I saw the prices and I said, are you crazy? Don't you know how expensive it is? No, 
we'll get movie, you'll get candy elsewhere. <laughs> choices, you grow up and you start having to make your own choices. And so I want to teach a little bit out of a, a story where we find three young individuals who are faced with a choice. It's found in Daniel chapter 3. This is a story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you're familiar with the story, just to briefly summarize it for you, we have three boys that were living in Jerusalem that were taken captive. At that time, the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, invaded Jerusalem and captured all of the best and the brightest, all of the strongest, best, brightest individuals, and among those were four. There was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and things were doing, these were going really well. They were, Daniel was interpreting dreams, so the king showed favor on him and put him in a high position. The three others then were put in a high position by Daniel because he said, hey, look, I'll take care of my boys. I'll, I got you. Don't worry. So he put them into high positions, and everything was going great until they were faced with a choice. At that time, the king had built a giant gold monument in his honor to, dis- to display his kind of his glory, his his honor, everything that he has built, and everyone in the land was told you have to bow down and to worship it. And that's where we leave off in Daniel chapter 3, verse 9. We should have it for the screen. There it is. They said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Choices. I think a lot of times we can read stories in the Bible like David and Goliath, and we think about the bold faith that David must have had to go against a giant. That takes some bold faith. Or we read stories like Noah and the ark, and the amount of bold faith that Noah must have had to build a giant boat when everyone else is telling him, hey, you're crazy, what are you doing this for? Well, God told me there's going to be a flood, and I have enough bold faith to go and do that. I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea that that's only what bold faith looks like. But I'm here to tell someone today that bold faith isn't just what you do, it's what you don't do. And especially when we're young, this can be hard. It's hard at any age, but especially middle school or high school, we care about what people think. Even into our 20s, it's hard not to care what people think. The youth makes fun of me all the time because I still think that skinny jeans are in, and apparently the baggy style is what's in, so they're making fun of me. But I'm at an age where I don't care. I've gotten to that point. My grandpa, Dr. J, he turned 72 just a couple weeks ago. He's been at the stage of not caring for a long time. (laughs) We'll have family events. We'll all come over. We'll invite friends over. He rolls out of bed in his pajamas, hasn't showered, brushes teeth, nothing. He doesn't care. You get to a point where you don't care, but particularly when we're younger, it's hard. And how many know you can get to a point, I'm not talking just to middle school and high schoolers now, I'm talking 20s, 30s, you get to a point where it's like something's not working. You get to a point where you realize, you know, all my friends, they're partying, they're drinking, they're partaking in behaviors that I know aren't right. It's hard to say no. It's hard to make that choice, but that's part of demonstrating bold faith. And as we know from the story, they chose God. They made the right choice. They chose not to bow down. But it cost them. Sometimes when we demonstrate bold faith, we're rejected by people. And so what did the king do? He threw them into the furnace, yet they did not burn. They were not consumed by the fire. I'm running out of time here, so I want to make this quick. But the point is, Sometimes when we demonstrate bold faith, we're rejected by people, but every time we're favored by God. It's not just what you do, it's what you don't do. That's great, man. Thank you. Um, so Ian, I think I know what your problem was, man. Uh, you are not a girl. 
if your dad had taken you as a daughter to the movie theater, he would have had, you would have had him wrapped around wow. your little finger. That's how it is with my daughters, you know. We go to the movies, and uh, Karis bats her eyes, and is like, Dad, can we get a Slurpee? Yes. Can we get popcorn? Okay. That's why we don't go to the movies all that often. <laughs> but, man, I am 47. 40, I mean, no, Pastor Dan was really gracious. He's just a 40, 47, okay? That's where I'm at, people. But... Uh, I married Kim, my beautiful wife. You see her around here. She's amazing. Um, and then I've got three kids, Harmony, who's 15, Karis, who's 12, and then Davis, who is seven, about to be eight years old. And man, it is amazing. This is a full season of life. Let me tell you that, that when you have kids that are growing up, um, this is not, you, you don't have like a whole lot of free time, right? You, you have a lot of things that are determined for you because of the schedule of the kids and because of other responsibilities that you have. Um, but I got to tell you something, that at 47, 47 for all of you math people, it is a prime number. <laughs> this is prime time right now, baby. This is, this is the best time of life, and this is the season of life where I see that God's uh, desire for us is to build to do something significant for him and for his kingdom. And, you know, I, I, as a kid growing up, I used to love to build. Um, and I would do that with Legos. I had my Lincoln Logs too, but the Legos, they were great. And because I had this bin of all these different pieces that I could choose from and put together whatever it was that I wanted to make for that day. So one day those pieces would come together and they would be a jet fighter. And then the next day we'd take them all apart and put them back together again and it'd be a mansion, you know, maybe having a vision for what my, my future might be. And so... I loved doing that as a kid. I didn't have any plan. I didn't have any idea. I didn't have something written down or anything like that. Um, it was just up to my imagination what I was going to create with these pieces. Now, that's great when you're talking about Legos, to not have a plan. to not. I, maybe I had some, oh, I think this piece is going to look good here. No. When we're talking about our lives, that's a little different. We need a plan. We need a vision for what our lives should be all about. And so like this building here, a little over a year ago, things looked very different here in this building. You know, the, the carpet was way different. The, all the interior was different. The paint was so much has changed because there was a vision and a plan for what was going to take place to renovate this facility so that it could meet the, the vision and the function for which we needed this building to be designed for. And so there was an architect who had to put together plans, and as the team would come together and different sections of the building would be worked on, we had to refer back to the plans to see, are we meeting what it is that, that had been set out for the vision for this place? And I want to say for us, we need to have a plan for our lives as well. Now, Maybe you started out younger in life, you were in your 20s or 30s, and you're like, yeah, I've got a plan for my life. God has plans for my life too, plans to prosper me and not to harm me, plans to give me a hope and a future. And then life kicked you around a little bit, and you're like, oh man, things are a little different now than what I thought they were going to be. Mike Tyson said that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, Right? Anyone else feel like sometimes life just punches you in the mouth a little bit and what you thought was going to happen did not happen the way that you had planned? You think about The Lion King. Man, what a great movie. Back when Disney movies were fantastic. <laughs> so Simba is being raised by his father Mufasa. And he's told about what his inheritance is and what the plans are for his life. And then life knocks him around a bit and he thinks he's responsible for his own father's death. He runs off into the wilderness. How many of us have run off into the wilderness in our own lives? 
He runs off into the wilderness and he, he meets up with uh, Pumba and Timon and, and they, they have a great time together, right? Singing a hukuna matata. What a wonderful phrase. I'm not going to bust out into song because you would hate that. But he lives his life and he just kind of goes along with the flow. But he has an encounter with Rafiki who comes back and tells him about how he knows his father. And he's reminded of the plans that were set before him previously and the calling that was upon his life. And so Simba, just so curious about Rafiki and what he says about his father, chases him through the jungle and then eventually has this experience looking up into the sky and encountering his father in the clouds. Mufasa speaking to him. He says... Simba, who you are is greater than what you have become. Maybe the Lord would speak to that, speak that to our lives here today for some of us. That who we are and who we're called to be is greater than what we have become. You know, life, life knocks us around a bit. And then what happens is that we just kind of forget maybe the plans that God had set out for us. We need to remember, just like Mufasa had told his son Simba, that remember who you are. And I want to tell you, remember whose you are. You are not determined by the things that have happened to you. The value of your life does not depend on the mistakes that you've made in the past. The value of your life depends on the price that our Heavenly Father was willing to pay for you. And so, do not devalue yourself because of what's happened to you. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. In Romans 12.1, this this is what it says. It says, therefore, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, God has been so merciful to us, to offer ourselves, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship, or as another version puts it, this is our reasonable service. This is the logical thing for us to do, is to put him first. And to, to put his plans in place of our plans. Some of us, we've had plans for what we want for the future. But let's follow God's plans for our lives. You know, when the disciples, Peter, James, and John, were with Jesus, one day he asked them, you know, who do men say that I am? And they said, you know, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're John the Baptist, and Then he asked him, well, who do you say that I am? Peter piped up and he said, you know, well, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus responded back, declaring to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Now I call you Peter, and upon this rock, the rock of revelation of Jesus as the Messiah, I will build my church. I want to tell you that God's plan is to build his church. Let's join together with him to not just pursue our own plans, which might be well and good, but let's pursue God's plan for our lives. Remember who we are, because who we are is greater than what we have become. Amen. Well, I'm 71, going to be 72 next month. You know, at that age where you start getting aches and pains, and (laughs) so my neck started hurting, and I realized that as I moved it, I heard this, like, crackling sound. And, of course, I just ignored it (laughs) until the pain got bad enough, found out that it was some degeneration. Our bodies kind of start wearing out. 
And so the doctor told me to do certain exercises to strengthen. Turns out that if I don't have good posture, if my back muscles aren't doing their thing, uh, then my neck has to do more work. Hello? So pain is a great motivator. Doctor said I should do Pilates. 20-year-olds aren't the only ones that are concerned about looking stupid. I put off doing this because I was sure I'd end up at this class of 20-year-olds and I'd be the worst one in the class and make a total, um, you know, idiot of myself. Well, pain's a great motivator, so I, when I ended up doing what I was told to do, the exercises that would strengthen me, the pain is gone. And I, the only thing I wish now is I would have done it a long time ago. Well, in the same way, there are physical exercises that strengthen us. There are spiritual exercises. As I look at the season of my life, you know, I love where Psalms talks about. 145.4 says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Well, this, if we want to know what God wants us to do, there's a lot of things, but this is purpose. If you want purpose for your life, know that you have something within you, and there's always someone younger than you, another generation. <laughs> At my age, y'all are younger almost, except for you, Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> the hurt and pain that I've gone through you know, I can encourage and give hope to you. I love going out in the foyer and, and just talking to the young moms as they come in. And I remember this one young mom, his, her kid was just zipping off. You know, he didn't want to be staying there. He wanted to get to class. The mom was all embarrassed, and she was looking at him like, a, uh, you know, kind of out-of-control kid. And I thought, no, no, I'm looking at him. This is a future staff member. He's excited for Jesus. He wants to do the things of God. And of, as a parent, as a mom, as a dad, as a grandma, grandpa, you know, it's part of our challenge, our responsibility to, I mean, if they may be tigers, but let's, let's channel them to be tigers for Jesus. You know, because stubbornness, anointed by God, becomes steadfastness. These movers and shakers are not easy to raise. <laughs> right, Dan? <laughs> so what are some spiritual exercises that are going to get help us to really do the purposes of God in our life? All right. They're going to sound easy in some ways, but when we put them into practice, the Pilates, I mean, it looked easy, but putting into practice, doing it the right way was life-changing. Hey, step, stay plugged into community. Yeah, stay planted in the house of God. If you're watching online, I love you, and you get to see my smile, but I don't get to see yours. When I look around and I talk to you, you bless me so much. But even more than that, life is not about me, me, me. The purposes of God are reaching out and helping others. And the crazy thing is, is when we reach out and do things for other people, we get blessed ourselves. I mean, we all can smile and say hello to someone. Um, I love doing that. And, and one late time I told a lady, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And she looked at me, and I didn't realize till later. She told me like six months later. I mean, this is a very extreme example, but it shows the power of just being open and smiling at people. She says, I was so depressed, I wanted to go home, and I was planning on killing myself afterwards, but you told me you were happy to see me. That changed her life. You can change people's lives just by your inclusiveness because you being happy and smiling and giving them a warm welcome opens up their hearts so that they can really hear and experience the power of God. So staying in community is powerful. You know another thing is when we worship, enter into worship. I mean, we're not just singing words. Yeah, that uh, whatever it takes, you may need to close your eyes. Right now, I absolutely love the music. And I'm so excited, and my only problem is that as I enter in, 
I mean, I feel like crying because the power of God is so present. It's healing things on the inside. I use the words like a prayer. Um, Sometimes it's for myself, things that I'm dealing with. Sometimes it's from other people that uh, relationships that need to be healed. And I put their them as a picture in my mind, and as I'm worshiping, it's like a prayer unto God, and I'm in his presence, and it's absolutely life-changing. So that's part of the spiritual exercises that you can do. How about actively listening during the message? I mean, when I first became a Christian, I remember hearing talks, and um, if the preacher would say something, I'd want to Elbow Jim, and and because I figured, yep, that's for my spouse. He really needs to hear that. <laughs> or I hear some of them, yep, hey, you know, that's for my kids. Boy, did they, boy, did they really need to hear that? <laughs> or my grandkids. <laughs> but what I found powerful, what I found life changing, wasn't that. When I really lean in, listen, God. Can you help me to hear what I need to do to change me? Because when I change, everybody around me changes. It's exciting. It's powerful. And then we get to leave a legacy. Yeah, part of that is offering. Yeah, I mean, we're not just uh, getting extra money to buy ping pong tables so the youth can play ping pong. No, we're creating an atmosphere there that they can bring their friends that they're not going to get into drugs, that they're not going to make unwise choices because they are going to really hear, really hear and experience God and know that it's more fun being in the house of God than doing all the stupid things that their friends are doing. I, I have seven grandkids. I get to influence their lives. You know, when they come over, and usually they give me, like, Minutes warning, hey, Grandma, I'm in the area. Can I and about five of my friends come on over? (laughs) Sure. I mean, I would rather the mess and uh, the chaos be at my house and the noise. And where I know that they're doing, and I, hey, are you hungry? Of course, what a stupid question. Teenagers are always hungry. (laughs) You know, I treat them to pizza. And they get to experience Grandma's love. And then later on, you know, we get a chance to talk, and they're more willing to hear the things of God when I've spent time with them, when I've shown them tangibly I love them. I love getting older. There are so many more people that I can influence and that I can encourage, and I want to encourage you, don't fear. Like the world tells you, don't get older. No, it's great. It is absolutely phenomenal. And one of my uh, scriptures that I really enjoy is Psalm 23. God's love never fails. Why would I fear the future? God's love will pursue me all the days of my life. Come on, can we thank him one more time for... Oh, so good. That was incredible. You can live boldly for God no matter your age or whatever stage of life. It looks different. Life changes, but we shouldn't stop living boldly for God.